Dave from Montebello, uh, Alhambra Source. I'm here with the uh, recipient of the American Society of Cinematographers Lifetime Achievement Award and Academy Award nominated cinematographer, Mr. Dean Cundy. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you? <laughs> all right, how yeah. you doing? Very good. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming to our awesome, amazing, huge newsroom that we have here in Alhambra. Well, I tell you, I'm, I'm impressed. You can't really see how far back it goes. It's amazing, and all those people at their desks yeah, yeah, I really like the huge windows yeah. that we have over there, you know. No, it's got a really great, nice. great view. Yeah, yeah, great. <clears throat> so um, basically, uh, I wanted to start from the beginning, uh, March 12th, 1946. Well, that, what a coincidence. That happens to be my date of birth. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, but uh, so on that day, um, mm -hmm. you were born in now Hamburg, California? Actually, technically, I was born in El Monte. Okay. Um, my my parents had come from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I was born six months after they arrived here um, because they wanted to get out of the cold. Um, but we moved pretty quickly to Alhambra. I was here mm, within a year or so, I guess. My father built a house in Alhambra on uh, Montezuma. And... Um, so we, we moved in there, and I spent all of my life up to um, college and getting married in that house. Mm -hmm. So you were born in Alhambra? No. I or, was, I mean, in Almani? I, well, I, I was actually, te I guess, technically born in Altadena because the hospital was there. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, I lived uh, almost all my life here since the age of one year old. Born and raised or whatever in yeah. Alhambra. Alhambra, yes indeed. In Alhambra. Okay, and then you did all of the uh, Fremont Elementary School, Alhambra Unified School District and all that? Oh, yeah. When you went, you went to Fremont and then you were saying Alhambra yeah. High School. I went, went to Fremont. It was a beautiful brick building, um, which was, um, when I got there, it uh, had been closed off and condemned and torn down uh, probably within a year or so um, because it was unsafe um, seismically. And so I lived in uh, temporary buildings for a lot of the time at, um, you know, and they always call them temporary. I don't know why they do because if you look around, how many schools are still built out of temporary buildings? But, mm -hmm. uh, but I lived uh, uh, all my life over on Montezuma and could walk to Fremont and um, spent all of my grammar school years there. Uh, I was going to ask you, like, what, what kind of childhood or adventures and things do you remember maybe as a kid around Alhambra? Is there anything maybe you remember or? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I had a, a fortunate childhood for the period, especially. Uh, Montezuma, which was on the far west side of of um, um, Alhambra, the, it was a cul-de-sac, and at the end of the cul-de-sac was what would become Monterey Highlands or Monterey Park. Um, but it was just rolling hills of uh, grassland, and there was a big giant eucalyptus on top of this hill, and there were little valleys of canyons. And uh, that was our playground when I was a kid. We would go hiking. Um, of the tree up at the top, which was the only tree on this whole hill, uh, was where we would climb and we built a sort of tree house. And, and um, you know, I, when I had a BB gun back in those days. <laughs> that, that's always fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, would, we would go um, up into those hills and, and we had a safe place to set up cans and practice and, and so forth. So, um, you know, and then across the, the, well, what became the freeway, um, which is now Cal State LA, um, there was a, uh, those were open fields also, and uh, there was a little creek. It was a drainage creek for water. Um, so there was a little stream that ran all year round, and especially, of course, during rainy season. And um, so, so we had... Um, uh, I, I had a country um, environment 
I had a perfect kids outdoors and outdoors and hiking right in the middle of uh, Los Angeles. Wow. So it was, uh, and long before, as I drove down Main Street today, I was amazed at how how much growth and construction and tall buildings and um, you know, Alhambra was little one story, maybe a couple of two story office buildings, but. It's it's an amazing transformation from where I grew up and what I grew up with, um, sort of semi country to um, the city. Now this industrial kind of. <coughs> mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Yeah, so a big difference. Yeah, definitely. Wow. But uh, it afforded me this really um, almost idyllic childhood because I had a mix of. Um, being able to go up and play in the hills and get lost. And, and those were the times when it was, you know, it was kind of safe. Parents didn't say, you know, oh, wait, wait, no, 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 I'll, I'll drive you one block away to your friend's house. That kind of seems to be lost now where yeah. kids just don't go out and well, do that anymore. Exactly. But, uh, you know, we had, we had rules. My, one of the rules was we had to be home before dark. But whatever we did then. Right, so we built forts and stuff, and then it was starting to get dark, and we knew we had to go home. Yeah, we would play baseball out in the street, and if you, uh -huh. when you heard the whistle, you know, that was or whatever, it was time uh -huh. to go back in. It, yeah. was, it was done. Exactly. You know. So then, uh, I mean, you did the intermediate, then Alhambra High School. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, like, what were some of the local hangouts that you guys, during high school time? Um, was, <coughs> was a restaurant or some? Well, uh, Tui's was, uh, was one. It was a... Um, it was a drive-in. You could still park your car there, and a car hop would come out and um, take your order. So, um, <clears throat> and um, I don't know. We had just various – I don't know if we really had a hangout. Um, at least the crowd that I went around with didn't have a specific, um, a specific hangout. But um, as I was driving, I, I looked at some of the buildings – and I remember um, very fondly things like, uh, the, I guess, the corner of Chapel or whatever. There's a um, building that used to be a drugstore, a five and dime. Um, and um, going shopping there with my mother when she had to go pick up something, there was a uh, fountain, a um, you know, soda fountain counter. And uh, we would get a hamburger and I could get a uh, root beer float or whatever. Um, so there was the, the, that kind of um, period, I guess you might say, when there was that kind of stuff. And, and the, the memories that it afforded me, um, you know, were, were um, really very nice. And it's, it's interesting to see it um, turning into all kinds of other things that, than what we'd have had. You recognize the building, just a different, like, paint job on it now, different color. Yeah, but building, the shapes... <clears throat> anything, everything from Garfield East sort of has kept its character. And I remember um, the clothing store that uh, one of my friend's uh, family owned and uh, Alhambra Camera, which was uh, a significant store for me because it was across from the high school. And I would go from, the, uh, from Alhambra High School to uh, uh, the camera shop, and they had a um, <clears throat> they had a, a news rack, a newsstand with magazines, all kinds of f photography magazines. One of them was American Cinematographer, and that magazine sort of documented the the uh, art and and craft of cinematography. It's still, you know, being published. Very, it's a very prominent magazine. And when I saw that, um, I'd always been interested in film, but when I saw that in the camera shop, I realized that's what I wanted to do, that I wanted to uh, be part of making movies and creating illusion so the, so the, um, the camera shop can take some credit for my... Uh, Helping you kind of zero in on your exact, niche to... Exactly. Wow, wow. Yeah, I, I had a camera store, actually, you know, after high school and go look around at all the mm -hmm. different 
things and be there for an hour or so, you know, before the bus, going back home or something, I would, yeah. you know, different chemicals and all that good stuff, you know. Oh, yeah. I miss no, the smell of that developer and the fix and all that. Well, that's, <laughs> those, are the, those are the formative things, I think, that, that motivate us to go some, some direction if we happen to have an interest. Yeah, and it's good young to get that young. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you if you remember maybe H Halloween in Alhambra. What did you used to do? What did you guys, anything specific that you might remember? Well, Montezuma, um, as I said, was a cul-de-sac. So it was a very quiet street. There was no cross traffic. You know, every now and then some car would turn around up there. And it was a great community. Um, almost everybody on the street for that one block knew each other. Um, there were, I had my very best friends lived um, sort of next door. <coughs> there were um, friends, um, oh, I don't know, at least every other house. And we would dress up for Halloween and go trick-or-treating up and down that block and uh, around the, the next corner, which was also a cul-de-sac. So we had very safe trick-or-treating. Um, everybody knew everybody, so, you know, the, the handouts were quite succulent. <laughs> <laughs> they always, oh, you know, they didn't want to be considered cheapskates, I guess. Because so everybody knew everybody, so exactly. they Exactly, kind of so, you know, you, you always would get a really great candy bar or something at, at uh, each house. Wow. And uh, we dressed up of whatever was appropriate at the time. My um, Superman was a big um, uh, TV series with George Reeves, and um, you know I was enamored of that. And so my mother made a Superman outfit because they weren't generally available. Yeah. So she made one out of uh, she took some um, long johns and uh, got a size too small or so, so it would be stretchy. Um, and dyed them blue and found some red trunks and made a cape from scratch. And uh, so I was Superman um, every other year here or so. Nice. <coughs> cool. Cool. And speaking of Alhambra, you were saying that's where you, of course, you know, built your custom van. Yeah, I, um, um, I, I met when I was going to Cal State L.A. across the freeway from my house um i uh i met a young lady there and um you know we spent the good part of our college years together uh ended up marrying her and um we uh, decided because she lived up in monterey highlands which was the the uh, housing tract that um, was built at the end of my street mm -hmm. so <coughs> um I, when we uh, got married, we decided we wanted to stay in the neighborhood. And uh, so we lived first at a, an apartment on Al Alhambra Road and then uh, moved to a uh, rental house um, on Atlantic. And um, in the backyard there, I built my movie van, my uh, production equipment van, and uh, built it all by hand uh, myself and with a couple of friends. I was looking at through some old photos and I just kind of, I think I saw a photo of it like in the background, but there was like a rack on the top of the van or something. Yes, like. it was heavily modified. I took a regular van and then um, had, um, you know, put doors on the opposite side of where they were regularly. I went to a junkyard and bought um, additional doors. I installed them myself and I put a rack on top of it to uh, hold equipment and and um, as a platform for a camera. And, um, you know, so it was quite an extensive um, building job. Yeah, I was reading about it, and I guess, you know, what well, Deborah Hill, I guess she called it the movie van? Yeah, I called it I called it the movie van. I had to come up with a name. So <laughs> that's what I, um, what I named it, and that was the, the logo on the side and oh, everything. Oh, wow. I yeah. didn't see the logo thing. There wasn't the yeah. picture of that. Okay. Well, I... I put the logo on later. I I wanted to keep it low key so it didn't advertise. Didn't really, yeah, uh, you know yeah. when I parked it on the street during a production. Yeah, yeah. And then also you were telling me I think that you were saying that your children were born in Alhambra and. Oh yeah. 
your <clears throat> yeah when we lived on Atlantic um, we um, you know both the kids were were born there um, Chris went to uh, to um, Garfield uh, school and um, then when uh, our daughter was born um, about oh, a year or so later um, we decided to move to a, a um, you know a school district um, that a friend of mine had recommended in La Cunada. so um, we we moved there so both the kids were born and and partially raised in Alhambra mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I had another question I was gonna ask you if you still visited Alhambra but obviously you're here today so that Answers my question. Now. Yeah, I, I've uh, I've driven through, and uh, I um, my I remarried, and I took my um, current wife for a little tour, um, so she could see the old hood. Yeah, <laughs> and um, you know we stopped for uh, ice cream at Fossilman's. Nice. And um, you know just uh, drove around. I sort of gave her the history of uh, this was this, this yeah. was that. I used to yeah. Exactly. Wow. Wow. Well, okay. Um, so I wanted to kind of maybe change gears a little bit over here. Um, this year, you're celebrating the 40th anniversary of the original Halloween. Mm, that long already, eh? Only? Only 40? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, um, it's amazing. It's a film that has, has kept an audience interest for so long. I mean, I, I go to, you know, fan conventions and and um, you know, teach classes and stuff. And um, the, I'm amazed at how many young people in their 20s and so forth come up and uh, say, "Well, oh, how much they they love the film." It's it's had such a, a long history of um, of you know popularity. So it's uh, it's an amazing um, phenomenon, I think, to uh, to have been part of a film that that you know is popular with people who weren't even born when it first came out it's like it uh withstood the test of time definitely exactly. um i also wanted to bring up that this year you're also celebrating the 30th anniversary of who framed roger rabbit mm, yes that's correct 1988 right and you were nominated for uh oscar academy award the next year and 89 for that film as well yes that's correct yes and then also i just kind of wanted um well and it was weird well with the halloween you know the anniversary and then they're making a remake of that this year mm -hmm. but then also this year you're also celebrating the 25th anniversary of jurassic park that's correct and there's a remake of that this year as well that's correct Mm -hmm. yeah so i just yeah. kind of <laughs> i was like well, where's the remake of roger rabbit this year i'm thinking well um, that's an interesting story. Uh, the uh, the studio has wanted to remake Roger for uh, or do the uh, the sequel for uh, quite a while, but uh, Bob and um, and Bob said no, um, not really. And Stephen and the studio couldn't decide. You know, Disney couldn't decide on on a story. So I think um, Roger is safe as in the original version for now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I was just going to ask, uh, wh what do you prefer as far as a title? Do you prefer cinematographer or director of photography? Because in the credits of the Halloween, it says director of photography. What do you, I'm just asking, like, what do you well, prefer? Well, um, it's interesting. They're, they're both correct. Cinematographer is the generic term for the, the craft and art and job that I do. Director of photography is the title of um, uh, uh, in your position of uh, you know credits and authority and so forth. So a director of photography is a cinematographer, um, but a cinematographer isn't necessarily a director of photography. If you follow, you know, it's like saying I'm a doctor, but I'm not a cardiologist, or I am a cardiologist. You know, so it's it's um, it depends on you know w w how it's used. Uh, it's, little complicated. I just kind of need a little clarification yeah. on that from you just to kind of, so I'm correct with whatever I, you know, my writing sure. and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Halloween was your first collaboration with John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. Correct. And I was reading that Deborah was the one that contacted you? Yes. Um, 
I, I had worked with Deborah on, mm, I guess, three or four low-budget action movies. Um, you know, that's that was where I sort of got to start um, doing these films that were for drive-in theaters back in the days when they had drive-in theaters. There was actually one in the neighborhood here. Um, and um, so um, then uh, uh, I got a phone call one day from Deborah. She had been the script supervisor on about four, I guess, um, low-budget movies. And she, uh, she called me and she said that she had written a script with this other guy and um, they were going to make the movie and they were looking for a camera person, a director of photography. And um, she thought that he and I would make a great team. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, oh, well, that's, that sounds good. She uh, said, yeah, his name is John Carpenter. Um, would you like to come and meet him? And I said, oh, well, of course. Uh, so um, I met with John, and we, we talked, and he described the project. And, and uh, I thought it sounded very interesting because it was, for its time, very unique. And, um, you know, so we apparently hit it off, and as a result, uh, we made the movie. Yeah. Um, actually, while I was researching you and reading about all that, I kind of became really fond of Deborah just reading like her story and what she kind of maybe kind of had to go through at that time as for a woman mm -hmm. in movies and films yeah. and and but I was just like wow she she seems really amazing and you know um, while while I was researching you I was just thinking of that but um also a little fact or whatever is that uh, her and I share a birthday she's uh, November 10th 1950 um, November 10th uh, 1977 so we do oh. share that day uh, I see. You know. yes indeed yeah so I was like Wow, uh -huh. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Uh, how was it working with Deborah? I just wanted to ask you. Oh, it was great. As a, you know, I was impressed when when we worked uh, on these low budget films, and she was the script supervisor. I was very impressed by the fact that uh, she just didn't sit and do her job, which is keeping track of scenes and information and stuff in a book, notebook. Um, she always had perceptive questions, insights, you know, she would come up and ask me, would it be better to put the camera over there and uh, instead of here? And I said, well, that's a good, why do you say that? And well, I, I think because of this and that. And I would say, well, that, we'd thought about that, but uh, then the guy's going to come in over here. And oh, okay, okay. So, so she was always thinking about making the movie. Curious to see Curious, and, and get your opinion and perceptive and um, she she had opinions that were good you know I very often I would say oh that's a good idea mm -hmm. and I would do something to embellish the shot so so you you know you understood that she was interested in making films um, as opposed to um, just a job and um, so I wasn't at all surprised when she called me and said that um, um, there was this guy in this movie, and would I like to team up with him? And um, <clears throat> I wasn't at all uh, surprised to find out that she had co-written the script. Um, she was co-producing. You know, she was she was very smart and hands-on about stuff. Highly involved in yeah, everything definitely. in all aspects, or you mm -hmm. know, exactly. Wow. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about lighting. As a photographer myself. Uh, I'm just starting to kind of get into recreating lighting. I'm mm -hmm. more looking at natural light. I was right. more just daytime or whatever, low light, but never really worked with lights. And I mm -hmm. just started to kind of mess with lights and working on sets and stuff like right. that, which I really find interesting. And I'm, I mean, I'm learning something every every shoot, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but you had complete independence on the lighting of the Halloween movie, correct? Pretty much so, yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, it, there's always a collaboration between a director and a and the director of photography, um, because uh, you know my my job is to implement visually capture the images of what the director wants the film to be. Um, a lot of the time, there's a, a very very great you know trading of ideas and collaboration and and so forth between 
myself and a and a director. So, uh, it you know the 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 lighting was um, pretty much my own. Um, you know, we John and I would talk about the shot, the intent of it. Um, you know, if uh, an area was supposed to be dark or contrasty or whatever, um, and then um, I would would uh, light it. And um, so I I I feel you know a great deal of sort of satisfaction knowing I I contributed um, you know pretty you know considerably to the look and and um, feel of of Halloween. So it, I I view it as a film that. That uh, I was, you know, uh, and I, uh, <clears throat> I have to say, as I, I often do. That before working with John, um, I had worked with directors who um, weren't always imaginative. They they thought of the camera as a device for recording actors talking, and um, what um, you know what I was interested in was using it to uh, visually tell the story and en engage the audience and create mood and emotional reaction and everything. And um, so when I started working with John, it was became obvious he had the same sensibility, the same desire to use the camera as a storytelling device, not just to record the action. Um, so it was it was a great deal of satisfaction to to know that um, he and I, you know, worked together to create um, the look of Halloween, and that I had a, you know, a, the freedom to to contribute so much. How how difficult is it recreating the light that you vi you vision in your head, and then actually creating it on set? How difficult is that to kind of? Well, it's interesting because. Um, as as you were saying, what what I would typically do is look at real life and say, oh, where's the light coming from? Why does it look like that? Um, and then uh, I would look at other situations, spooky situations, unusual situations, night exteriors, things like that. And then of course I watch a lot of movies to see how the um, the guys would light a scene and. And you, you have to sort of pick it apart and say, oh, I see the shadows over there, so that means the light's over there. The angle of the... Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, so um, you know, it, it's always a learning process. I mean, um, you know, even today, I never walk somewhere without saying, oh, I wonder why it looks like this. Oh, I see. Yeah, they have a big skylight. You know, that kind of thing. So um, it's, um, <clears throat> it's a case of saying... You know, you, you usually start with what is the intention of the scene, what should it look like in order to create whatever the emotional reaction is. Is it supposed to be funny, scary, an old time period, whatever particular things for the, the movie itself and, the, and that particular scene. And then you uh, look at the location <coughs> and you say, well, how can I create, you know, mystery or spookiness here, um, what would the light sources be that would make it dark and moody? Um, and then I would, um, you know, say, well, if we put a lamp over there, that would be a good source, and some light through this window. And, you know, so you, you sort of deconstruct, I guess, backwards, you might say, with uh, what's the intention, and then how do you do it, as opposed to walking into a room and saying, okay, yeah, there's enough light here. We can shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was just, you know, looking at the Halloween movie, It towards the second half, it's generally like a dark lit movie. Um, and you also, I noticed like you, you use the, the lights and you also use the shadows with like Michael when he comes down the stairs after Lori. I can see that. I mean, like it seems like you're using the light, but you're also using shadows as he's coming down and then the staircase thing just kind of and i uh i thought that was uh yeah you know um lighting is not just about light um you know what what creates mood and and 
shaping of faces and shaping of environments and locations is is the shadows. You know, with just overall light, um, you don't get any modeling and shaping. So it's all all about what kind of shadows um, will we create? Um, will we? Where will we put the light to to uh, deliberately have a shadow in a certain area or, or whatever? So it's um, it's always about light and shadow. The shadow, I think, is just as as important as the light. Mm, absolutely, and sometimes more important. Yeah, and then also I noticed a lot of the blue light in the Halloween movie. Does that maybe uh, is that supposed to simulate like a full moon? Yeah, you know. Um, to not to get too technical, but we've uh, we've sort of gone with the convention that blue light at night is the moon, the mysterious. There's always a full moon um, in a lot of movies, um, and I th I think that's because they, you know, the the technical explanation is that your eye is made up of rods and cones, and the cones are what allow you to see color. And the rods are brightness. Well, when it gets very dark, the cones don't work anymore, color. So very often, if you go out at night in moonlight, um, you aren't really seeing color. You're just seeing brightness and darkness. And as a result, there's very little color. So in order to simulate that, we take away a lot of the color and make it just blue. So as an audience and as a camera with film, um, you can see, but it uh, it creates this illusion of lack of color. <coughs> so it's a um, kind of a convention, and and I decided it was a great contrast between the blue and the warmth of the interiors. Well, I noticed too, like the <coughs> the blue, it almost seems like the light. It just kind of like it feels like Michael's looming around or something in that color just for me it seemed because you know the, as he comes out of the shadows into that light it kind of lets it, it kind of just seeing the blue light alone just kind of like he could be around any corner yeah i think that was that was sort of our um our intent in creating um a light in which he dominates um you know in which he lives in the um when it was no longer daytime uh, and it was night and, you know, his world, um, then, um, you know, I, I decided to go with the, the blue. Uh, more blue than would exist in reality, but um, it was, you know, just part of the storytelling. I mean, uh, I just, for me, I thought it was more of the moonlight uh, in the movie, and I actually went back in the lunar calendar and looked up the... Uh, the lunar phase on Halloween in 1978, there was no moon that night on Halloween in 1978. It was almost practically a new moon. What? Why? You the, mean, so that I think you're just you pulling we, everyone's leg on that. We and that, were and that. lying to the audience. Is that what you're saying? I think saying? That, that's just the magic you guys are creating. Exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, it's surprising how often there's a full moon in movies. Yeah. It's like... Every night there's a full moon in the movies, you know? Exactly. <laughs> and then also with the white light. Uh, Lori's on the couch and she kind of sits like to look up into that white light, like a safe light mm -hmm. versus the blue. I just, you know, is that was was that the intent with the with the white light? Yeah, I think, um, y you know, we we um, as as people, I think we subconsciously make these associations because, you know, we've been sort of. I guess taught over a period of time by experience uh, uh, certain things, and um, I, I think the idea is that um, we we in, when it's dark we light areas, we turn on lamps, we we put up you know street lights, we you know, and and that light is always sort of the safe area, or we hope it's the safe area. It helps us see if there's any danger. So those were the two contrasts that we went with the the blue, which was the um, you know the mysterious dark night um, lurking uh, area for for Michael, and um, you know then the the seemingly safe areas, um, which you know 
the the uh, the excitement is always when the safe areas get violated by evil. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. so that's a surprise and the. Um, you know what you're always going for, and that's like you know the suspense. Also, along with music and the lighting, <laughs> provokes the emotion. Exactly. Okay. Um, just uh, change some gears again. Um, uh, what do you remember about filming on location in Alhambra at Garfield Elementary? Well, it was um, it was ironic for me because uh, I I hadn't really chosen the location that was done by um, typically you have a location scout um, on a movie whose job it is is to know um, all kinds of locations around LA mm -hmm. and the various cities and so forth so it was chosen um, by um, I think our production designer and and a couple other people and they said oh well we found this school um, which is very uh, sort of middle of the road could be in any city and the the film supposedly takes place in Haddonfield New Jersey um, so they they were looking for a, a school that wasn't Spanish or something you know that like so many of them are in in Los Angeles and they uh, they found this one and they when they told me where it was I said oh my my gosh that that's actually two blocks from my house in backyard yeah um, I I walked to work the, those days, um, but it was uh, and uh, also ironic because it's the school my son was attending. Wow! So was that the only location that was filmed uh, for the movie in Alhambra? The school that was the only place, right? Every there, everywhere else was like Pasadena and Pasadena, Hollywood. Industry and um, all that. Just up the street, though, on, on Fremont is is uh, South Pasadena High School, where we also um, shot a scene where the the girls are coming out of their school talking about, um, you know, doing math and so forth. So did the, the Garfield Elementary, did that double as Lori's classroom as well? Yeah, we shot inside, and um, uh, Lori was um, sitting by the window daydreaming. and Looking and, out. Uh, and right, and Michael was lurking uh, by the car he had stolen. Yeah. Yeah. Anything specific you remember during filming those scenes or the car scene inside or anything? If you can. Well, one of the most vivid memories is I could walk to work. Okay. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, no, it was it was um, you know actually kind of fun because um, y you know anytime you work in a familiar area, you sort of become you know com More comfortable kind comfortable of with it. So. Um, you know, I, I remember thinking of, you know, and, and the fact that he'd made a good choice because it was, um, you know, a nice looking location. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Um, I wanted to ask you if, the, if there was anything you would like to say to the people of Alhambra. <coughs> I, I have to say Alhambra was, um, I, I grew up in a, what I think is probably an idyllic time period one of the last, 1950s. Um, I was born in 46, right after the war. Um, everybody was interested in getting back to normalcy. Um, and everybody was celebrating, you know, um, returning to a, a, a um, pleasant lifestyle. So I grew up during that period. Um, I had, you know, the hills up at the end of my street and the stream across the way. Um, I had uh, very nice schools, um, you know, and um, I had good friends. I, they, what was interesting uh, uh, about Alhambra at the time was that I, I, I noticed, but I never really questioned why so many of my friends had Italian last names, um, you know, Cacciatore and Argento and, um, you know, majority of my friends all had Italian last names and I would go over to their houses and mom and dad would be speaking Italian. Um, so um, one day I asked and they said, oh yeah, Alhambra was the part of Los Angeles where uh, the Italians after the war settled because it was their community. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I grew up with uh, a completely mm, sort of Italian uh, environment around me, um, which has gra gradually changed, of course. 
Um, you know, so it was it was an interesting time for me. Um, it was a great um, small town, you know, Main Street. Mm -hmm. You know, what, mm -hmm. what small town doesn't have a Main Street, right? Um, all of these little shops, uh, uh, drug stores, and a, and a um, you know, just restaurants and... And Sounds like a wonderful time. <laughs> it, it, it really was. You know, I'm, I am very, very fortunate to have grown up in the 50s. And, um, you know, when there was very little strife or whatever, uh, especially in L.A. and Alhambra. Um, and to grow up in a, a town that was so um, normal, so regular, um, it was not... <coughs> You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a specific town like you grew up in a farming community. You know, your whole life is about farming. Um, you know, you grew up in an industrial town like Detroit, and it's all about making cars or whatever. Alhambra was this generic town, and the guy next door sold paper for Zellerbach, and the guy on the other side worked for the post office. And, uh, you know, there was just a, a whole... Uh, complete, you know, middle America uh, kind of feeling. Community. It was. And and as a community, it was great, too, because, um, you know, I, I went to the YMCA on Almanser um, at Almanser Park, um, which I looked around and I couldn't find it. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, I took tap dancing there and swimming and all. So it was... This this great um, community, um, you know, to for me to grow up in. Nice, nice. All right, uh, I want to switch directions here. I wanted to talk about the new Halloween production. Mm -hmm. um, there's some that's coffee right there. I put a little bit of creamer. I think it was a half and half because they didn't have anything to go. But okay. there's a sugar there as well, and there's a water there, as well. Um, I wanted to talk about the new Halloween production. Uh, any thoughts about the upcoming Halloween production? Have you seen it? Have you seen the trailer? Uh, do you think it'll hold up to the hype that it's going to be getting? And uh Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, we've been through, I don't know, a few iterations of sequels to Halloween. <clears throat> I did one of them myself, Halloween 2. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was always interesting to me that a successful film that everybody loves and is well crafted and and so forth um, is is the target for remakes. That um, you know people say, oh, that was a really great movie. Let's make that again, and they're bound to fail or have a very difficult time because um, what makes the first film popular is it's unique um, it it's you know fresh or whatever and w once you you know you try to remake really successful films you um, you have a difficult time because um, you know everyone how, how can you top it yeah oh exactly you know <clears throat> so I I don't know I um, I saw the um, the remake of Halloween that um, that um, Rob Zombie did, and thought it it missed because what what was interesting about the original Halloween is that it was the first what we now call I guess a slasher movie. It was the first film that was horror about everyday life. Um, <clears throat> we've had horror films since who knows when they made them in the silent period. Universal made a lot of. Dracula and Frankenstein kinds of movies. But Halloween was the first one that was about sort of real life. <coughs> it wasn't about um, um, atomic energy morphing uh, cockroaches into giant creatures and things mm -hmm. like that. It was, you could relate to it. Um, you could be a young girl living in a small town um, being harassed by a guy with a knife. Um, so that that kind of concept about it <coughs> um, 
made it unique, and it was the first one. Now, sometimes it's hard looking back after we all go through so many new horror films, not just Halloween, but, you know, there's always um, somebody making an inexpensive film. Kids lost in a forest and uh, trapped in a cabin and whatever premise they can come up with um, for the crazy killer to be after them. <clears throat> and then paranormal stuff, of course, is reason. Um, so it, you know, it's hard to kind of remember that Halloween was incredibly unique for its time, and to remake it, you're you're taking what was an amazingly unique premise, <clears throat> a unique uh, storytelling, and just trying to reconstruct it. And, and um, you know, you're just making a copy of a copy of a copy at that point. Mm. <coughs> Did you contribute to the new production or have some sort of give a blessing or kind of have any sort of... No, it's, it's funny uh, because uh, a couple of times uh, my agent has called people and said, uh, oh, you know who did the first Halloween? Would you like him to work on yours? Uh, very often they say, oh, no, the director's got somebody he works with mm -hmm. or whatever. So, so um, but I'm, you know, I'm just as happy because to have made the first one yeah. and to be remembered for that as opposed to saying, oh, and you also made that other one that wasn't as good, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I got to see the trailer, and I, I, I mean, it looks pretty good, and I think, you know, it's maybe going to maybe appeal to younger mm -hmm. audience that don't know about the original and all that. That could be, you know, if, the, if, the, if, they, uh, if they remake a film um, far enough away from the original, <coughs> so you have a brand new audience and, um, you know, a brand new sort of vocabulary in the filmmaking, uh, you know, the the uh, the uh, language of film changes over a period of time as we we change it, we modernize the you know the visual storytelling, the the, um, the so-called uh, dialect of film language, and and as you you change it to modernize it to what kids are used to in seeing in um, you know modern yeah modernize it yeah. Yeah, exactly. Video, video games and and um, you know music videos and things like that um, create a, sort of a new dialect of film language. And and if you approach it that way, then you can um, you know appeal to a, a younger audience. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, John Carpenter is going to be performing at the Hollywood Palladium on October thirty first. He's going to be performing all his movie scores uh are you going to be attending that by any chance I don't or did know. you hear I'm, about it i'm or? very i'm very tempted to go um at least for a while um because uh, john and i have been re redoing the uh, a couple of films we recently redid the thing that for color and a new release a mm -hmm. 4k release um and uh so we've we've talked a little and i know that uh that uh, you know, I ran into his wife Sandy, <coughs> and um, she said, you know, um, there, there's his, John's son Cody is also a musician. I plays guitar, I think. Um, uh, Cody had been saying, Dad, we should uh, we should play some of your music at a concert. Let's why don't we go to a club or something? And and John would say, Oh no, I I don't think so. I and Sandy said, "You know, John, they, they've got this concert, and and it would really be fun, I think." And John said, "No, I don't think." She said, "Yeah, you got to do it. Just okay, okay, just for the kid." <coughs> Apparently, he had so much fun that they decided to take it on tour, and of course, they they did it um, various places around the country, and. Um, now this is a um, another, you know, tour concert of it. Yeah, because I had heard that he had done it last year, and I didn't hear about it or anything mm. like that. And then recently, I you know they just announced it maybe about a month ago that he was going to do the tour, perform in Hollywood, and I was like, well, you know, and then with you and all that mm -hmm. too. And I'm just, anyways, I got my tickets on Saturday, so uh, 
I'm going to be there on Halloween and check it out. Oh, very good. Yeah, I uh, I may have to see about going down there and, and you should you it. should yeah. check it out. Stop by, you know, right. just see some see what's going mm-hmm. on over there. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask also, will you be attending the I guess it's Halloween 40 at the Pasadena Convention Center October 12th? Through the 14th, they're going to have something there, a Halloween thing. And I think Nick Castle is going to be there and a couple of other actors from the Halloween 2, 3, uh-huh. 4 and all that. And I just, since it might be like almost around your area, yeah. if you would be attending that um, one. Yeah, I've done a couple of those. Um, no, nobody called me for this one. Mm-hmm. So I uh, maybe they figure I'm too old. <laughs> but wait, we're all the same age. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was like Halloween40.com something like that. Yeah, I, I did a, um, a uh, fan convention somewhere, Ohio, I think, um, and uh, Nick was there and, um, you know, uh, some of the actors from The Thing also. Um, so it was it was fun to, um, to hang out with Nick, ha- not having seen him for 10 years anyway. Wow. Wow. Um, do you know anything about the Halloween 4K Ultra HD release that supposedly is coming out? Barnes and Noble's had something up or something that it's going to be out October second or. Yeah, um, um, as I said, John and I have been, um, you know, going over in uh, the various new releases, uh, the thing, Halloween, um, Escape from New York, I think. It so was. that does have your so blessing, though. Like yeah. With that, because there were some releases that were done on, you know, DVD or Blu-rays that they didn't really even no, contact that, you. No, that's that's the thing about these new ones, is that uh, very often um, the 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 ones before are sort of copies of copies of copies. They would, you know, they go back to some source material, but it wasn't the original film negative or whatever. And then they would, from that, they would copy it again, and <coughs> over a period of time, it would, it would drift, lose it. Yeah, some of the, um, the intensity and the, um, the colors would uh, drift. Sometimes the blue would sort of disappear. So um, we've been going back to the original film negatives or interpositives, which is right next to the film negative, um, and. Um, redoing it so it's a completely new very sharp crisp original color intention um you know they they put it through this process that removes little bits of dust and scratches so it's an extremely clean, clean um, and of course it's uh, now 4k they've up been able to up res so that wow. it's now uh, the sharpest um you know, image you can possibly get. Yeah, I was looking at another interview you did, and you were saying that it, it those DVD Blu-ray thing, it's not the original movie that you guys shot. Right. You know, so exactly. like that's why you kind of want to. Exactly. That's why I'm so delighted when uh, you know they just they just came out with uh, with the thing. Um, it's in a British uh, format, and I think they're going to make a, an American um, 4K version of it uh, soon. But but it's. Um, it's very rewarding to see the interest in in redoing them and and you know uh, reintroducing them to a new audience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, what future projects uh, will you be working on, or do you have anything lined up that you're going to be working on soon? Well, um, I there's always something lurking. Um, it's it's interesting. I've gotten interested in in um, you know, sort of indie films recently, rather than the big giant uh, epics, um, you become a, a, just a little cog in a wheel when you make a giant superhero movie. Um, so I've been interested in in smaller films where you can be completely, totally involved with creating and working with the director and actors and so forth. So, um, <clears throat> but getting getting those financed for independent people is is tricky nowadays so um there's always something pending um but um you know there's nothing uh, immediately so uh, there's about three or four maybes um but well I'm you do the documentaries the short movies whatever right. and, and then they, you do conventions and you do the classes teaching and all yeah. that so exactly. you're busy yeah. yeah i i do i keep 
keep very busy. People say, oh, aren't you going to retire? And I say, why would I retire from doing something I love to do? Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. All righty. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I wanted to ask you, how do you see the future of movies? How will they be viewed in the future? Will you, do you see any sort of difference or maybe a 4D? Will, they st will people still walk into theaters? Will they just watch movies online together in rooms online? How do you think the future of movies will be? I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, um, if I knew that, I could sell the answer to a lot of people who are wondering, you know, big corporations and stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's changed quite a bit. It used to be like in the, the 30s and 40s, people went to the theater three, maybe four times a week because that was their evening entertainment. And they made a lot of movies that, um, you know, some of which were, you know, very average, but some have, have become big classics. Um, and then television came out. And, you know, everyone said, oh, that's the death of movies. Everyone's going to stay home. And for a while they did. They'd watch on their their little round TV, which was a fraction of um, the size of the screen. And people realized pretty quickly, well, that's a fraction of the size of the movie. So they would go back to the theater. for, And, and the studios would do epic productions and, and so forth. Um, well, now, now it's changed again because, um, you know, TVs have gotten very good in your house. You can get a big one. Uh, you can get projectors and the 4k yeah. tvs i mean that you know exactly um but also it's it's become such a thing that people are almost content to watch on their phones um you know a, a really great movie and they just watch it on their phones because <clears throat> they're less sensitive to the epic quality of a film as the, it's the content you know, is it funny, is it whatever. And <coughs> what was interesting is about two days ago, I, I ran, <coughs> ran the thing at a um, post-production house that I work with. And um, the, it, the screen was very large. It was like a 15 foot by, you know, 30 foot screen. Um, and they invited um, a lot of the guys who were visual effects people and all to, to watch the movie. Most of them had never seen it in a theater. Almost all of them had never seen it in a theater. Um, some of them had seen it you know, on a DVD or something on a, on a screen uh, in their TV at home or something, or computer. They, they sat and they watched it and when it was over they said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This big screen is so immersive. I, I understood the story better. I understood the characters better. I was more, uh, it was more suspenseful. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize is that, yeah, for the convenience of pulling a movie out of your pocket, that you're really missing the experience that so many of us go uh, to great lengths to, um, you know, to create and to, to you know, you know, finesse the, the visuals and, and the story and everything so that it, it immerses you in it. Engage the audience yeah. and really, yeah. yeah. And so as a result, um, you know, a lot of people are missing out. And I, I think it's good that there are still people who want to go to the theater to see something big, you know, even even if it is just a superhero movie, um, but um, you know, it it's a shame that um, you know that that's sort of drifting away. I think it'll always be there. I think it'll uh, there'll always be an interest by uh, some people to say, oh, let's do something special. Let's go to a movie, uh, as opposed to in the 30s and 40s, they would just said, well, let's go to a movie because. That's what you did. Mm -hmm. Now it's uh, you know it, it costs more and the popcorn is outrageous and all of that. But um, it's still a it can be a unique experience, and <coughs> which is why I think people are selective. They want to spend the money on something that it's worth a worthy experience. That it's a good movie. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, finally, I just wanted to see if there was anything else you would like to mention or any last thoughts or if anything I skipped over or maybe 
see if you had anything else to say or no i think it's been pretty thorough all righty um thank you dean yeah i want to thank you for the interview and actually giving back to the community here in alhambra well you know what alhambra gave me so much as a kid you know it really it gave me my my life but you know, in my education, but my experiences, my attitude, my perceptions of the world. Um, you know, it's it's always uh, been a great community, I think, for, for people. And, um, you know, so I'm delighted to be able to come back and share some of that. And they gave you the camera shop. That well, <laughs> the camera shop that, um, you know, it sent me on my way. Yeah, yeah. All righty. Great. Thank you, Dean. Mm -hmm. My Thank pleasure. You.